My philosophy of life is that I believe that everything that you need to succeed in life is in you. Everything. Everything you need to succeed in life is in you. But every other thing that you need to do to make it in life is out there. So it is how you connect that ability that is in you with the potentials outside that makes you successful. And on top of that is that anyone who is successful and doesn't make any other person successful has failed. That's how I feel. Ali Baba is um, the young man from Delta State. I was born in Wari um, on the 24th of many years ago in June. And I happened to be the son of uh, a teacher uh, who later transferred his service to the military as, uh, and became an officer in the Nigerian Army Education Corps. My mom is a petty trader who then became a farmer and uh, she was a seamstress for a while and before we then relocated to Lagos. I was uh, born into the literary world because all my, my dad was a teacher, of course, and uh, all my elder sisters all loved books, novels, and that took me in. I got drawn into the literary world and I started reading at the age of three. And from the age of three, I found out that the larger world, you could experience the larger world from books, places you've not been to. And I started with Lamptey's from Shakespeare, I read Pace Setters, I read Mills and Boons, I read uh, Harlequin Romance, and got fixed on James Hadley Chase. Now, from then on, I then graduated into the poetic field of uh, Shakespeare. And my dad thought that I was going to become a lawyer, a broadcaster, or a writer. And with time, he felt that I must become a lawyer because every robo man wants his son to become a lawyer considering the land cases that they probably have back home. And with time, my journey through life threw me through command secondary school, threw me into command, brought me out of command, threw me into Hebrew College, brought me out of Hebrew College, and then into Epoma. So I went to Delta State University, Epoma, and graduated. But between the time that I got into Epoma and graduated, I discovered stand-up comedy. I happened to be the first son of uh, my dad, after several girls and you know the male syndrome thing was really very strong at the time where everyone thought that you must have a son if you did not have a son then they figured that uh, your lineage will not continue i was born as i said with uh, following several girls and all my sisters are girls and so following several girls i became um, the pet in the house and I became the most desired son or child in the house but my sisters did not let that be cloud anything so they still taught me knitting home economics and how to 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 just survive you know uh, on your own cook knit uh, iron wash and clean home just they domesticated me just to say and then, so most of all these things now started showing up when I became a man of my own and I could do a lot of all these things by myself. That said, my dad was very sure that if I did not become a lawyer, then I had to go to the military school. I went to the military school and deliberately flunked all my classes, all my tests. My dad, my dad would later say he had looked through my, because it was a Nigerian Army education course, so he could speak with the commandant to see what my uh, results sheet where uh, he said there's no way I could have failed any of all those things and I confess that I didn't want to be a military man. Anyway, I discovered stand-up comedy in the time that I was in school, reading religious studies and philosophy because I was supposed to read religious studies and philosophy for one year and change to law. I didn't change to law because I discovered stand-up comedy in year two and so when I discovered stand-up comedy in year two my calculation was if I change to law, I will go to year one and I will do another four years because law had changed to four years at the time. And if I did another four years, that would make me spend five years in school, one year in law school, one year in youth service, and then I'll now start hustling. I'll be like seven years gone and it's not medicine, kilo day. And yes, I felt, no, 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 that I was not going to. But in any case, I stuck to my stand-up comedy that I discovered at the time because it's 
it had a lot of potential for me. It had money, had fame, had clout, had respect, and uh, gave me freedom to be in charge of my destiny. You know, I wasn't depending on anybody to become who I wanted to be. And when I discovered stand-up comedy, everything changed. Had issues with my dad because he still thought that I needed to read law. And, and we parted ways because he said, until I read law, I shouldn't speak to him, talk to him, or get in touch with him. And so that was how I came to Lagos. Came to Lagos in 1989 and started hustling. And hustled for like a year and found out, man, things were not working as it should be. And I went to Abuja for my youth service. Served one year and came back to Lagos in 1991. And that is how stand-up comedy as a career started. The discovery of stand-up was by accident. I, I usually just, uh, you know, when I discovered this was during a riot that schools were closed. And so students were in school, there were no lectures, and we were hanging out everywhere um, but classrooms. And so uh, within that time, uh, we were watching a lot of movies from Anok the Commandos, Anok Schwarzenegger, from um, Escape from New York, and all of those movies, Rambo and the rest. And then Beverly Hills Cop. And we sit in the live, in the buttery, as a common room, to watch these movies. And as we were watching those movies, I would make a lot of snide remarks, I would make comments, and people were laughing and enjoying the comments more than the movies. One other thing that I found out that, was that sometimes the people who were watching the movies were all waiting for actions and not listening to conversations. And so some of the conversations were really very uh, amusing. Sometimes we were watching football matches and I would, be, I would be writing down or just taking in some of the comments from the commentators. And I found out that I had a funny streak because sometimes some things I said elicited laughter. And gradually, people started inviting me. Oh, we're going to watch this movie. Somebody just brought a movie. Let's go and watch it. And we we'll all go and watch it. And people will wait for my comments to, to really further enjoy the movie. And that's how um, I, got, uh, I got to know that I had a funny streak. And so with time, uh, I started uh, doing some small events in school from departmental events to faculty events and then went out of school to do some parties outside school and then there was a big show in, in school at the time that I went to uh, I think it was per, for, per, uh, put together by Percy Okoje and uh, there was a striptease and the striptease came on stage there were people were trying to run on stage and touch her and she ran off stage and people were like rioters it had a lot of people in school. But let me just mention that striptease happened to be something that a lot of us had heard about as young boys but had not seen live. And so when it came to school, everybody wanted to be part of it. So we all trooped to the uh, hall and wanted to see uh, the pavilion then. I wanted to see what this lady, how bold this person would be. And of course she came and when they ran on stage, she ran off the stage. and. I was invited to come on and help pacify the audience and that was how I stumbled into stand-up comedy. So in a sense, it was the striptease lady that brought me on stage. And so, uh, and the naked truth about my talent came out. I further developed the talent and started performing outside school and every other show that happened in school, I was invited as a guest. In fact, I was, I was now always a major side attraction in school. I started with the name The Resident John Chuku uh, and then gradually they now started putting my name Ali B uh, because my name is Ali Luya and so they put Ali B um, and they would then uh, change it, they further then change it to Ali Papa. So there were many uh, indices that pointed to the fact that I was going to be a comedian. Beyond the fact that there was some appreciation and some uh, um, subtle uh, applauses uh, when I was doing my stand-up, or being a heckler, because I was just a heckler in the initial stage, uh, there was um, the indication that my 
my status of being a comedian was appreciated by people. So because I started going to Auchi to perform, I went to College of Education, Ekea Dolor to perform, I went to Uniben to perform, I went to Uniport to perform, I went to University of Illinois, I went to Unilag, I went to um, Yabatek, and all of these places, as I went to those places and came back, the news was spreading that there's a guy in University of this, he did so well. So they would go there and find out and we say, oh, it's not a student. He came from Ekoma, so student union would then call me and say, oh, somebody called, or student affairs would say, somebody called from so and so school and they want you to come to their school, you know. So that was how I started growing. So some of all those indications pointed to the fact that I was going to make it in stand-up comedy. But the ultimate, the ultimate pointer was the fact that my allowance as a student was a hundred naira. A hundred naira was what my dad gave to me. And that hundred naira meant that I would go to Benin and collect the hundred naira if my dad doesn't send it. Or my dad would come to school and give it to me. If I went to collect it, it meant that I would spend about like two or three naira out of it for transport. But in any case, I started earning hundred naira per show. So what I waited for for a month, I could then earn it from one show. Sometimes I could earn 50, 50 naira, and then from 50 naira to 60 naira, 70 naira. So I could do it by like four shows in a month. And I'll have about like two, three hundred naira, which was nearly like what some teachers in school then were earning. And so I was, I was a big boy. And it, um, it helped to cement the fact that I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Because by the time I got to, by the time I got to year four, I was already earning about 500, 600 naira per show. So the 600, 500 naira that I was earning, 500 or 600 or 700, or if I'm going outside Bendel State to like Yabatek, I'll earn 800. If I, if it was Unilag, I'll earn 700 because those boys, the price, those Unilag boys. But to Yabat, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, the boys that paid the most were loot, the doctors, physiotherapy students association then. They paid the highest, which was 900 naira thereabout, and they gave me accommodation and sent a vehicle to pick me from Epoma. So it was, it was something else. Uh, I also then found out that uh, the the value that people placed on the thing that I had called what I wanted to do, stand-up comedy, was much more than I anticipated. So corporate body started inviting me. Harp, Guinness. Coca-Cola, well, all these big brands started inviting me. Nestle, Milo, uh, Gold Sport, all of them, you know, they, they would then invite me to come and do something, Leventis and uh, PZ, you know. Uh, and then we then had the Pepsi event, 7-Up uh, High Life. There was a, there was a promo there, 7-Up High Life, Coast to Coast with Fido Dido. And, and that was, like I think about nearly about a thousand naira and they paid me for two days and so I had had good money so I went back to school bought everybody out of my room and I was um, I was alone in my in my room as it were um, and it, it pointed to the fact that I could get comfort I could get uh, liquidity I could get fame I could get some uh, level of uh, recognition. So those were the things that pointed to the, before I then landed Lekki Sun Splash through a Dilawani. A Dilawani came to Ekboma. Let me mention that mu musical acts then were coming to school to perform. Oris Willicky, Raski Mono, Charlie Boy, Shino Peters, Jaguar, uh, Daniel Wilson, and uh, Blackie. And all of them that used to come to schools then to perform, when they come to perform, you need somebody like me to break the performance. And so I got to meet a lot of them and they liked my performance because they'll go backstage and they're waiting for the next time to come back on stage. And then they hear people laughing and then they come and peep to see what was happening. And when the show finished, they say, okay, we're having a show in Lagos. Would you be able to come? Something like that. Um, which was how I got to meet Kwam Wan, Shino Peters, um, Daniel Wilson, uh, Raskimono, Charlie Boy especially, and 
meeting Charlie Boy then made sure that when I came to Lagos and I went to Piman to see Adilawani, Adilawani took me to Piman and gave me a note to uh, Lekki Sunsplash where I then performed at Lekki Sunsplash with uh, Fela on stage with just name them all the big artists at the time from Venno to Nyeka to King Waliman it was it was a and it was a, like a three days concert and so and it was full every day and I was working together with uh, uh, Ulisa Dibwa um, and the stage manager was Pakris Ajilo Pakris Ajilo was the stage manager it was it was it was great it was great and that that those were the pointers as soon as those things clicked. I knew that I was going to be a comedian. At other times, you can come across a worried guy who will express a certain action that you ordinarily would not. For instance, let's say a Yoruba man is talking about a friend he saw. Say, ah, that man. He was owing me. As I was coming, the man was greeting me. I ignored him. Oh, Jare. <laughs> How was that man? We just say, well, he was greeting me. I said, the guy. Ibo man, he said, he was greeting me. Mba, no. I didn't answer. But when you hear a worry man talk about that same thing, you hear him. Oh boy, that guy when they owe me money, as I they work out, they sink, they come, the guy just begin to smile, they greet me. I tint. <laughs> you see, when, when I decided, you know, because uh, for me to have chosen it as a career path, there were several boxes that had to be ticked. One was the talent. First, you have, you have to discover that you have a talent. Uh, if you say you want to become a footballer, you must be on the field playing with the football for you to even be considered a footballer. So uh, there was a preparation um, stage, which was the preliminary stage. And the preliminary stage was the ability to read, ability to comprehend, ability to understand a lot of things. All right. Now, when I finally found that, then I then discovered. So the discovery period was when I found out that I actually had the talent. Um, every other thing worked towards on earning those talents. And so when the talent was discovered, it then became a point of uh, consolidating it and promoting the talent. So I developed the talent. Now developing the talent took a lot of ways. It was reading, it was listening, it was watching people, there was performing on stage. Because every time you performed on stage, you're honing your skills and getting better. And so that was the third stage. So the first stage was the development of myself. Second stage was uh, discovering the talent, mm -hmm. then, then promoting and developing, uh, the growing the talent that, I, that I've discovered. Then after growing the talent, I then had to consolidate that talent in the minds of the people who I was performing to. All the people I was performing to, um, some of them did not quite, up, because it was new, stand-up comedy. There was comedy, but stand-up comedy was new to a lot of them. Some of them did not even think that it was a talent that should be paid for, you know. So there was need for me to do some marketing. There was need for me to do some reintroduction. There was need for me to push essence. So the essence of this talent that I had had to be pushed to people for them to appreciate it. So the level of appreciation also had to come in. It was an uphill task because uh, some people felt because you are not supplying wood, you are not supplying cement, you are not. Supplying, there was it was nearly free. So people felt it should be pro bono. You understand? And people who thought that should be pro bono always had an issue with paying for it. And if I was going to survive, I needed to earn some money. Uh, then finding platforms was another issue. Finding platforms was one of the toughest issues because uh, everywhere you went, people were like, oh, I don't think we need comedy. And I could see the, the vacuum. I could see the places where I needed to plug myself in. So my plugins needed to be nightclubs needed to be parties needed to be weddings needed to be annual general meetings needed to be concerts and so those were the plugins that i needed but i had to work my way through the the dark tunnels to get to them and finally a lot of them then started accepting me because they then saw the value the proposition that i brought on stage because every time i came on stage people wanted more um when i then found out that people have started liking what I was doing, I had to then work a bit more. So I studied further, and it is not now that you had Google, or you have video messages, and you have uh, video facilities that people can see comedy and everything everywhere. I had to be working with um, 
the encyclopedias. So I will go to the library, comb through books, comb through literature, read uh, Shakespeare, complete works of Shakespeare, read stories of Mark Twain, and read uh, George Burns, and all of those were the things that I read to, to get myself. Uh, and my love for books started from the research that went into developing this career that people then now just, you know, people just think the 30 years was that you just landed running. But like the first four or five years of that journey was all about recalibrating, rediscovery, working hard, sleepless nights, uh, even dangerous nights because uh, sometimes you are jumping into a bus that is taking you somewhere. We are riding behind the back of pickups that were delivering newspapers across the country just so you cut costs, you're jumping into trailers with cows and uh, fruits, pepper sometimes. And so, and it was, it was a very tough task. But right now, you could become a comedian in just four or five years if you are good. In fact, two years if you are good, you, you can make the headlines. Then it took a while. Um, then there was a the case of uh, publicity. I had to promote myself. And so I started promoting myself uh, I did car stickers, I did the call cards, I did, um, ah, I struggle. So I'll do the flyers, I'll put them inside newspapers. So I'll go to vendors and tell them, can you put this inside the newspapers? Let people then see them. So some of them were photocopies. So print one and then you do plenty of photocopies and put them inside newspapers. There were no phones by then. And gradually phones, then, okay, I then got a place where, uh, it's, it's, it, it, the place was in Pangrove. I got the place where, uh, Tutu, that's the girl's name, yeah, Tutu. Tutu would take calls and uh, she would, for every call she took was five naira. And if I negotiated, I would then come back and give her something more. So, in fact, if anybody called, she would be expecting the call to be those calls because she, 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 does, she doesn't get paid for receiving calls. People pay to make calls. So, I was the only one that was paying to receive calls. Um, then, pages came. And so I got pagers, and so when I got pagers, I now felt, how would people then know how to reach me with these pagers? So I got billboards. I got three billboards. I got one at Marina where the Lagos State Governor's Office, opposite the Lagos State Governor's Office, where they have the ships parked now. So I had that opposite there. Don't forget that. At that time, the only road to make a U-turn into VI was to come from the front of NET building. They had not done the U-turn under Muson Center at the time. So you had to come through net building. And so I did the billboard right as you come out from that net building, you see my billboard. And on it was being funny, it's serious business. 4906278. And then uh, my pager number was 197, pager 197. It was, um, it was the most popular pager number at the time because it was on the billboard. So what happened was that people would just call and leave messages. And then they would call me, oh, somebody just called and said he saw your billboard, what do you do? And then I'll be, I'll be receiving all those pager messages and I'll be like, this one's are number. Then once in a while you get somebody who says, oh, we call from Linters. And somebody, Linters Advertising, somebody then calls and says, we call from LTC Advertising. Some people will call, we call from uh, uh, Center Spread Advertising. And then we call from Insight. Uh, all of those people then started reaching out to me. Anyway, I managed to connect with them. And the biggest punch came from a man called Steve Omogiafo, who had seen me somewhere before, invited me. He was in STB. This was before they became Makan. It was just STB then. They were at uh, Yaba left. Can you imagine? They were <laughs> if you're coming from uh, Fadi, they were Yaba left. Just after the mad people, they were the other mad advertising people next door. So I, that was where I met a lot of them. From Femi Odubemi, all of them were all there. So I went there and um, it was, it was a great experience because the, the, the thing that happened was that he wanted me to do uh, something for him at Baja Catholic Church where he was worshipping. And so I went to Baja Catholic Church, I did the thing and he was very impressed with me. And when they then had another event, he then told them to come and book me. And so when they came, I told them that my fee was, because I was coming from uh, Ekpoma, so I said it was 700. No, I didn't mention 100, I just said 7. And the guy said, no, that is 5 they could pay. By the time we went up and down, he said, okay, he will go and bring the money. So he went and brought the money. And it turned out that I was talking 700, he was thinking 7,000. And so he brought it and the rest is history.
Okay, so with that, having come into the Lagos scene and uh, found a few uh, appreciations from uh, advertising agencies, because the advertising boys were the boys that had seen the value that I brought to this thing. Don't forget that it is not actually the owners of the media houses that would see you and see your value. It is all those foot soldiers that see you and then recommend you to their bosses because they're the ones that then do all the, um, the work. And so those were the ones that then interfaced with me and thought, ah, I think you would need you for this Coca-Cola event. I think we will need you for this uh, uh, Jilos Begia event. I think we need you for this Nestle event. So Cadbury and all of them. Uh, so I, I started, um, I started building relationships with these people. Uh, meet them, we'll play football together, we'll attend birthdays, we'll meet at events. And then I was combing through newspapers as well. I will go through newspapers, I'll see where there's an AGM. They'll say an AGM is holding on the 7th. On the 3rd, I will go and meet the company secretary and say, I am a comedian, is it possible for me to have a few minutes at your event? Some of them will be like, no, 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 no. But what I did was I, I managed to build those networking, those networks. And networking is very key in uh, developing any brand. And by the time I had grown that brand, um, many people now tied in. So I started, while I was waiting for the big break, I was a cartoonist. I was a columnist with uh, uh, Sunday Times. And my editor was uh, Dukbe Ajayi. Um, I, worked briefly at Classic magazine. I dabbled with uh, cartoons uh, when uh, Sonia, who was a cartoonist at uh, Fame, left for overseas, I think. I then started doing some drawings for them. Um, then I did nightclubs, did a lot of nightclubs. Um, some turned me down, uh, plenty turned me down, and um, because they didn't think that it was, because most then it was just dance, dance, dance. So there was no time to break to now have somebody perform. But in spite of that, I still had some places who accepted me. Roots Nightclub, Lots Nightclub, Jabita, uh, which was opposite Eko, um, Lagos Airport Hotel, Jabita, uh, Class Nightclub, uh, Eddie, Eddie was there at the time. Uh, then um, I also then Peak Nightclub, uh, performed at Peak Nightclub, and then Bread and Butter, Pintos did not accept me. Yeah, Pintos did not accept me. Night Shift did not accept me. Um, they, they, didn't, they, didn't want, they didn't want anything to do. Then Jazzville then became the home for a lot of stand-up comedians like me. And so myself, Mohamed Danjuma, Tunji Shotimi, Alain Blo, uh, we were, were frequenting uh, those places. I then moved from, I moved from that point to becoming a television uh, comedian. So I was doing youth scene, because NTA was the only one that was then at the time. So I was doing youth scene, I was doing Sunday Night Live, a Sunday show with uh, Livia Jonoma. I was doing uh, Saturday, uh, Morning Ride, that was what the show was called. Morning Ride with uh, Femi Shegun, with um, Princess uh, Sheung uh, and um, Pat uh, what's it called? Then I did Friday Night Live with Patrick Doyle. Then I was on a Charlie Boy show. I think I did one or two um, Chase by Moonlight. And um, but I did not think I wanted to be an actor because I did stage. Yeah. Uh, not television actor, but stage. I did uh, work with uh, a bit with them, Chuck Mike. I did uh, some stage plays at the National Theatre. But they were not, they were not what I wanted. I, I wasn't feeling the vibe, especially with the fact that the kind of money they were calling. Because when I then said that I was earning 700 for 20, 30 minutes, they were like, <laughs> you are joking. Because at that time, the fee that some of them were charging was nearly like, Child's play. I, I, I didn't think I was going to do it. And so I was, I was earning big bucks, earning 1,000, earning 2,000, 3,000. So by 1992, 
three. I was already a big boy, earning close to five to ten thousand per show. Then the big box came, and when I launched uh, Satin Brow across the country, and it was uh, Eddie uh, ID Enang. Uh, who was the brand manager of Satin Brown then that came and took me. I'd been doing some things for Guinness and he had seen me. So when they made him the brand manager for Satin Brown, he needed to make an impact. And so we went on a tour around the whole of uh, Nigeria. And when we came back to Lagos in 1995, after all the tours, and they gave me my check of 1.6 million Naira in 1995, I felt like I was a CBN governor. But it was, you see, a lot of people will not know how much 1.5 was. 1.5 at that time would buy like 10 plots of land in Lekki, even if I was wise at the time, you know. But then, we thank the Lord because uh, that then made me feel if I could earn that amount of money from promoting a certain brow for just two months, then there was need for me to invest so much in the, in the career. And then I did. Um, turns out that uh, I was not just um, a comedian after all. So I was writing. I had a, an NDA with a lot of advertising agency. And so I would write copies for adverts. I would write scripts. Uh, I would uh, write episodes for certain things. But NDA meant that I could not disclose that uh, I was the one. As a ghostwriter, I enjoyed it. I was making money as a ghostwriter for copies, for scripts, and it didn't matter. I was just earning good money. And then I, I finally got my show, Tom, Dick and Ali, on African uh, independent television, when uh, Doc Bessie saw me somewhere and said I should come. 